one of the things he understood is that the reason people thought the four previous presidents had been failures is because of this impression the American people had that, that uh, the president was simply overmatched by events. Mm. The presidents were worn down by the job. And he self-consciously wanted to project the image or the view that no matter how difficult things might be, their president has things in hand. Besides being one of conservatism's most prolific and gifted writers, he's the author of six books and one movie, a documentary. Uh, Steve Hayward is a kind of pioneer. The trail he blazed last year was at the University of Colorado Boulder, where he taught in the political science department as the school's first professor who was out of the closet, <laughs> way out of the closet. He was a conservative. Uh, I mean, the, the scarcest and most vilified of all campus minorities. Though his gig as the visiting scholar in conservative thought and policy is now over, he provided a wry and illuminating running commentary on the experience on powerlineblog.com, where he has been a contributor since 2011. Steve Hayward's career has led him through many distinguished parts of the conservative intellectual movement. He got his Ph.D. from Claremont Graduate School in 1996, worked a while at the Claremont Institute, the Heritage Foundation, and the American Enterprise Institute, and is now a senior fellow at the Pacific Research Institute and the Thomas Smith Distinguished Fellow at the John Ashbrook Center. In the new academic year, he will become the Ronald Reagan Professor of Public Policy at Pepperdine University's Graduate School of Public Policy. Speaking of Ronald Reagan, Steve helped to pioneer the serious study of the man and his times. Steve's magnificent history, The Age of Reagan, has no equal. Its two volumes, The Fall of the Old Liberal Order, published in 2001, and The Conservative Counter-Revolution, published in 2009, will form the basis of today's discussion. So Steve, welcome to the American Mind. Well, thanks. Let's start at the top, as it were. Um, you call these uh, large, important, impressive two volumes, The Age of Reagan. Why that title? Well, partly it's uh, an obvious homage to the literary model of Arthur Schlesinger's Age of Roosevelt, whose style, uh, leave the content aside, whose style I think was very engaging. They're very broad scale narratives that not only tell the direct story of Roosevelt and his liberalism, but also have a lot of the context. In other words, the whole first volume of the Age of Roosevelt was an attack on the Republican stewardship of the 1920s, right? So I, I thought that... Calvin Coolidge, uh, uh, among others. Calvin yes. Coolidge, mm. and, well, it was the, 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 the whole trilogy of Harding, Harding and, Coolidge, and, and Hoover, uh, much of which, of course, was got things wrong. But right. as a literary model, it's very compelling, I think. Uh, they're great reading uh, because uh, Schlesinger was a great writer. Uh, and uh, I think that that style of broad gauge narrative has somewhat fallen out of fashion. It's not done mm -hmm. very well anymore. We have a lot of these very narrow gauge books, sometimes now books are about a single week in history that can be interesting, but it's hard to get the whole picture. Uh, uh, in the mid-1990s when I started thinking about this, no one was really working on Reagan. You had Eben Morris writing the official biography, and I'd had a hint from hearing him talk once that his biography would be very narrowly focused. I didn't think it would be insane. I just thought it would be <laughs> too concerned with Reagan's personality. Yes, it was quirks. entitled Dutch. <laughs> right. And the, and the joke was it should have been entitled Botch. Botch, exactly. Yes, right. right. Uh, and, and that's when the light bulb went off in my head that there's going to be room for and need for a book mm. that put Reagan in a larger context, that told the political story. Uh, not, not just what happened, but why it happened. Um, Your book isn't a, a biography, really. It's a sort of what would you call it, a life and times? Yeah, very much like, yeah, another literary model would be uh, Churchill's Marlboro Life and Times. Mm -hmm. um, there have been a number of Life and Times books over the years. As I say, not so many in recent decades, but that once was a preeminent literary form. Uh, no, I start the story in 1964 uh, with uh, Reagan's, I, you might say, formal entry into politics with the famous Time for Choosing speech on behalf of Barry Goldwater. Here and there I have a little bit about of his biography of his years in Hollywood, a few details mm -hmm. of his childhood that I think are important, but mostly we pick up the story in the middle. 
so to speak, with the beginning of his political career and then the events around it that helped shape it. Now, uh, Schlesinger's uh, famous Age of Roosevelt uh, was left incomplete, I think, wasn't it? But it was, uh, it was never accused of being unbiased. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was terribly tendentious. Is your book uh, terribly tendentious? Uh, well, I don't think so, but I may be biased the other way. Uh, I, I try to adhere to, uh, um, uh, the book is sympathetic to Reagan, of course, and, and, but it doesn't necessarily try to tell the story from his point of view, mm -hmm. uh, it, especially in the second volume uh, on his presidency, where the narrative is much more tightly focused on the events happening in and around the White House. I have a number of very sharp criticisms of him, mm -hmm. especially on the way the Iran-Contra affair unfolded in the disaster that happened. Uh, and here and there I have some uh, mild criticisms of uh, the way domestic, pol domestic policy was managed. Uh, some of those I, I think are things you chalk up to just the difficulty of the office and all the things that happened and it's easy to be critical in hindsight. Uh, but I do try and adhere to Churchill's rule of narrative writing. Now of course he was writing about himself, Churchill was, <laughs> but it's to try and write uh, 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 from the point of view of what you understood was happening at the time and what they were thinking at the mm -hmm. time rather than enjoying or indulging the uh, benefits of hindsight. Now, were, were Reagan's own volumes of biography or autobiography useful to you at all? How do you, how do you rank those books? They were somewhat helpful. You know, his first autobiography, Where's the Rest of Me? Right. From the uh, 60s. From the 60s. It's uh, got some really wonderful passages into it. It really describes how he became a conservative mm -hmm. in late 40s and 50s and into the 60s. Uh, and then his autobiography as president, or his memoir, My American Life, they don't, that, that does not go into great detail about anything, except here and there there'll be a, a useful line, um, uh, uh, some illuminating lines. I think of more use to me were two things. Uh, the diaries that were ultimately mm -hmm. published around, I don't know, 2005, I forget just when. And they're not introspective. These are not Count Chiano or some of the famous, you know, or the memoirs of de Gaulle or something like that. But they're very useful for triangulating, where mm -hmm. he'll comment on decisions facing him. And here and there, if you really are deep into the story and other sources, there's a very helpful and revealing statements he makes in the diaries. Uh, the other thing that was helpful is uh, we now know that Reagan wrote an awful lot more of his own material than people thought. Yes. We know especially the story of the radio addresses in the 70s. Uh, we know the lots and lots of letters he wrote as president in his own hand, so they weren't written for him by a correspondence unit. Mm -hmm. And you can also see how he marked up speeches, because all those drafts and uh, various iterations are now in the Reagan Library, and you can see uh, things like the Evil Empire speech in particular, entire paragraphs he wrote in, other places where he would edit things out. Uh, and so you can see that uh, here was a very sharp mind in, and skillful mind, uh, not only in editing and making mm -hmm. things more simple, but also in asserting key points that, in many cases, a lot of his political staff wished he was not making. The evidence contained in those marvelous volumes you, you, uh, you mentioned that contain his radio scripts and the diaries and so forth, has that affected scholarship on Reagan in general? Has it raised the estimation of him as an uh, amiable dunce? <laughs> As uh, Clark Clifford famously right. said. Oh, I think it's led to a complete revolution in how Reagan is regarded even by his many critics uh, and people who don't sympathize with his point of view. I mean, what they recognized was uh, he really had a much more alert mind than they thought, was much more in command or on top of events than they mm -hmm. thought. Still lots of mysteries about Reagan, and we can talk about some of them. Uh, uh, but now, uh, even authors who, uh, I think of Richard Reeves wrote a biography mm -hmm. that's very complimentary, uh, Sean Wilentz of Princeton, who's, who thought Reagan should have been impeached over Iran-Contra, nonetheless is very complimentary of Reagan in other aspects, and they all say that he enjoys a presumption, one recent author said he enjoys a presumption of being considered uh, uh, in the first rank of statesmen. And he worked a lot harder than a lot of people thought right. all along. Of course, he was marvelously <laughs> humorous <laughs> about his own. <laughs> I right. remember one of his jokes which was, uh, they say, uh, working hard never killed anyone, but I, but I, I don't want to take a chance. I say, why take uh, Well, why take a chance? Right. That's right. Right. Yeah. But part of that was, uh, but that opens up to a, some larger, really interesting things. Uh, partly that was deliberate art on his part. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he would, he actually worked almost as hard as Jimmy Carter in terms of taking too much reading up into the uh -huh. White House residence at night to the point where in the first six or eight months or first year, Nancy Reagan was complaining to the chief of staff 
he's staying up till midnight. He's staying up till 1 a.m. reading all the paperwork you're sending him. He's not getting enough rest. You've got to cut that down. So he'd take an armload of uh, books up, uh, you know, briefing papers upstairs at night. When the press office wanted to send out a photograph of him to dispel <laughs> the, the constant refrain that he was lazy and not hardworking and was a nine to five president, he always refused and never gave a reason why, although uh, I'm told he told a couple of his friends that uh, he, one of the things he understood is that the reason people thought the four previous presidents had been failures is because of this impression the American people had that, that uh, the president was simply overmatched by events. Mm. The presidents were worn down by the job. And he self-consciously wanted to project the image or the view that no matter how difficult things might be, their president has things in hand. And therefore, the people shouldn't worry as much as they might have under previous. So there's some art to this, some dramatic. No, that's uh, interesting. So it's not that he, uh, he, he, he wanted to be more democratic or more like an average guy but rather that uh, it, there was a kind of spiritual um, uh, assault on the country that had to be met with some kind of new confidence in the presidency. I think that's exactly right, although I do think he had a democratic uh, uh, character or quotient in this as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way you saw that was something similar. If you'd asked him what he was reading, Barbara Walters one time asked him, well, what are you reading, Mr. President? He mentioned some Louis L'Amour novel. <laughs> Who's reading Louis L'Amour novels? Right, well, it's, yeah. your, you know, it's your truck driver, it's uh, sure. your cowboy, it's your ordinary American. He would not mention the serious books he was reading at the same time, which his staff knew about. So, you know, books about Soviet, Union, Soviet history, mm -hmm. uh, uh, missile defense technology. So why would he do that? Well, that wasn't an accident. Uh, he never felt the need, and people will tell you this who knew him, uh, especially intellectuals, he never felt the need to demonstrate that he was the smartest person in the room or the mm -hmm. equal of these smart people. He was perfectly comfortable in his own skin, as a right. cliche goes. But I think he understood that it was, or, or another way to think about it is, <laughs> Reagan would wear plaid suits in <laughs> Washington. Well, first of all, they were not just any plaid suits. They were very expensive, hand-tailored suits, you know, and he dressed very carefully mm -hmm. and thought about how he looked, from his acting days, thought about how he was sure. seen in public. Uh, but on the other hand, who wears plaid suits? Well, it's the uh, salesman in Peoria. <laughs> in other words, uh, he wanted to look... And brown suits. And brown he also plaid wore brown suits. suits. Oh, yes, yeah, right. absolutely. And Washington was horrified. Even George Will said, I can't believe his president is wearing a brown plaid suit in Washington. Mm -hmm.